भगवते वासुदेवाया ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया Live from beautiful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Sleep and Sunday. Welcome to Interview Day. But before we get into Interview Day and interview our honored guests, I want to say welcome to everybody. I had a great day yesterday at Yoga Factory at Zeb's studio. Zeb, Uh we we, we did a last-minute thing at Zeb's studio. Because I had to come to Pittsburgh, and Andrea and Zeb set up workshops for me today. I'm at Andrea's um, Sangha Center in Beaver, Pennsylvania. Zeb packed the place, and we had Hari Kata. We did a yoga class, and then uh, you got to hang out with Zeb. Zeb's a special soul. He is. He's a special soul. Some previous life yogi, bhakta, like deep, thoughtful. You did some kirtan. Did a little kirtan, a little chanting. Yeah, he's inspired. He's coming to Italy for the uh, Italian. By the way, we have one space left. There was one cancellation. We have one space left. If you're thinking of coming to Italy, if you've been sitting on the picket fence and like, I'm not sure. If you've been walking on that slack line of which way to fall, fall towards Italy. We have one space. And this is a a Krishna miracle that it's opened up for you. I think we need Brother Nature. Get Brother Nature in that spot. I want to find out more about this person. Yeah, you want to hear something crazy? You want to hear a Christian miracle? Okay. This is a total Christian miracle. So when we were all monks and Shelter lived in the ashram in Philadelphia, there was one kid from Reading, Pennsylvania, who used to come to the ashram all the time. His name was Todd, Todd Group. Okay. Years later, we always sort of stayed loosely connected. I know Todd. Right? You know Todd? Yeah. Of course. We I stayed from... loosely connected yeah. for years, but very loosely. Then one day, um, when me and my wife first got together we came to uh this was like 20 years later i came to uh india via thailand and i ran into todd in thailand okay just that was sort of random running into a person in a restaurant in thailand that was weird then check this out then i then he came to india with me years later then i haven't seen him again then over dinner yesterday justin was talking about kung fu that he does he did when he was younger, and he talked hold about it, this hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Check this out. Check Justin this out. is Hear a kung out. fu recovering drag queen. My assistant Justin, before drag queen time, he was studying monkey kung fu and yin <laughs> yoga from the yin yoga master Paul Greeley. All right, Holly Zink. And check this out. I said, "Oh, I think my friend Todd studied with him." I texted Todd, who lives in Sweden. Todd sent me a picture of him and Justin from like thirty years ago. Is that a Christian miracle? It is. I accept that. Mathematically, yeah. That's impossible. Not impossible, but miraculous. You know what? We're going to have to ask the spiritual scientists, like, <laughs> what are the chances? What are the chances of these Christian miracles? I bet our the spiritual scientist, our guest today, he could probably do a mathematical equation. Well, that's my point. Figure. Yeah, you, you know, it's got to have statistically, you know, mathematically, it's got to be, um, there's got to be a certain point where we can call it miraculous. Yeah, I mean, for example, we had, when we were setting up, if you're listening uh, as one of the others out there today who are not on Zoom, you know, all the Zoom people pile in. You know, we get about, you know, 80 people on Zoom, 100 people on Zoom. And then today, out of all the Zoom people, the two Sherrys were right next to each other. Like, does that qualify for a miracle? <laughs> like, in the Catholic Church, would that bring, you need two miracles to make somebody a saint in the Catholic Church. Do you know yeah, that? Halfway there, Sherry. We're half the, sher- the two sherrys are halfway there. I don't know. We got to ask the the uh, spiritual scientists. Is is it, you know there is what, what 70, makes something a miracle? Chaitanya what Chiron makes something Chiron. a miracle? What are the odds that it becomes a miracle? Anyway, it's all quite fascinating. Um, anything he has else an we, answer for us, or maybe he doesn't. He, I, he's holding. He's holding back. He's he's filled with answers. I'm going to ask him questions about the Naga planets. Today. No, we're not supposed to go. Like we don't go anywhere in this interview. We're going to. You don't have to go to the Naga planets. It's like, That's what important. They, what? It's like like I've I been waiting to, for the spiritual scientists just to ask about the Naga planets. I try to come up with a plan, a rational plan, of where this interview can what go. Is, what is and you want to throw in like the, the planets of the snakes? You know, what is more like, rational than planets of snake people? Yeah. Okay. 
I'm not making this stuff up. It's in the Bhagavad Tom. Okay. We need a solid answer. Well, the, okay, in that context, we can bring it up. That'll okay. work. That'll okay. Work. He's holding back. He's got answers in his head. I'm looking at him in Zoom right now. By the way, I want you to know, Kostuba, there were so many others out there. Others, meaning people who are not listening on Zoom, they're just yeah. listening. I just met a whole handful of others. The whole, I call them the Pittsburgh others. Wow. It's like teams of others from Pittsburgh just doing their thing in Pittsburgh, not at 5 a.m., and then tuning in later. Binge listening. So I'm going to give a shout out to the Pittsburgh well, my others. My parents live in Pittsburgh, you know, so I'm, I haven't seen them since COVID started, but afterward I'll probably drop in Pittsburgh. Maybe I can meet some of these others. Yeah, the Pittsburgh others. Speaking of meeting others and meet, meeting, you know, Zoomers and all that, are we confirmed for next Sunday for a Central Park? We are having picnic? a. Central Park picnic next week. What do you think next of that? Next Sunday? Central Park. We're going to have a picnic. We're going to have Kirtan. Everybody's well, invited. Everybody's invited. There's no fee. And right. it, it's, it, it, it's just a hangout session with Wisdom of the Sages people. So, We're going to give you more details tomorrow. That's what I was going to say. Because we haven't, <laughs> we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> okay. But uh, mark it on your calendar. Mark it on your calendar. Sunday, Wisdom of the Sages. Yeah. We're going to have some type of sporting event happening there. It's going to be either volleyball, softball, or a wrestling match. Tug of war? A <laughs> wrestling match. <laughs> a ultimate UFC is going to happen. I stayed right. up till 1 o'clock last night and watched the UFC. All right, Robert. Let's get, it on, okay. let's get on point here. Okay. Om namo bhagavate We already did that. <laughs> we already did that. Okay. Yeah. But why don't we read the, the bio of Chaitanya Charan for Okay. okay. I was say, so Ch- we've had Chaitanya Charan Prabhu on our show before. He's a monk, a mentor, and a spiritual author. He graduated from Government College of Engineering in Pune with a degree in electronics and telecommunications engineering. And just to show you, like, you know, I consider Chaitanya Charan one of the, the great thinkers of our time. Literally, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. You know, I think, like, you know, on the most important subject of, like, bhakti and yoga philosophy... He's just one of the greatest thinkers out there. He yeah. scored 2,350 out of 2,400 in the graduate record examination, which gained him the top rank in Maharashtra. What? You know how many people there are in Maharashtra? <laughs> there's, there, like, there's like more than 100. There's like yeah, there's, millions. There's like 100 on, like, on every uh, train car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's like insane. Amazing. 112 million. 112 million. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> oh, million. All right. That's pretty good. That that's a Krishna is, miracle in itself. That's a Krishna miracle. Yeah. He subsequently served as a software engineer in a prominent multinational software corporation. But seeing the prevalent problems of stress, depression, addiction, and overall misdirection, all caused by lack of spirituality, he felt inspired to dedicate his life to the cause of sharing the spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. So now he travels the world. He gives talks on spiritual subjects in universities such as Princeton, Stanford, Yale, Cambridge, and companies such as Intel, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Google, as well as TEDx. Wow. Yeah, he's the author of the world's only Gita Daily feature, wherein he writes a daily 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Till now, and this was probably written a while ago, so it's probably a lot more than that. Till now, he has written over 3,000 Gita meditations that are posted on www.gitadaily.com What? When you, whenever I hear these bios, I'm like, what am I doing with my I know. life? I gotta get my life together. <laughs> I'm, a, too. I'm a mess. He does that every day. <laughs> okay. He also answers questions by seekers on his site, thespiritualscientist.com where his, where his over 3,000, he has over 3,500 audio answers and several hundred articles are available. His articles have been published in many Indian newspapers, including Indian Express, Economic Times, and Times of India in the Speaking Tree column. That Speaking Tree column is like a really big thing over there, you know, it's read wow. by millions. I mean, that, the, the, in, Times of India is the biggest newspaper in the world. Is it? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. would yeah. surprise me. You've got to ask the spiritual scientist. He has the answers for everything. <laughs> okay. He's a member of ISKCON's leading intellectual body, the Shastric Advisory Council. Ooh. Yeah, and he's the associate editor of ISKCON's global magazine, Back to Godhead. Now he's, he's, also, his... he's also the author of 22 books. He's not wasting time. Like he's not us. wasting a moment. We get all distracted. He's like plugged in. I know, I'm talking about the UFC in front of him. I'm so <laughs> stupid. 
<laughs> Chaitanya Charanpuru, welcome to Wisdom of the City. Welcome back to Wisdom welcome of the City. Welcome back. Thank you. It's a privilege and a delight to be here. <laughs> and I often hear your podcast. And I am amazed to see how two things, how creatively and appealingly you are able to present the wisdom of the Bhagavatam that I have been studying for years. And how you are able to build a community virtually. So I am very inspired by what you are doing. And I'm glad to be, uh, I'm grateful to have an opportunity to have some service today. Oh, thank you. So Chaitanya Charan, you also teach Bhakti Shastri because I'm at Rachel's house, Rachel and Jeff's house, and she says she's studying with you directly. That's yes. one of the courses you're offering? Yeah, that, uh, it's a self-paced learning course. So I did the recording of the whole Bhakti Shastri and then it's uh, available. Devotees can hear and then they can learn and they can ask questions and I answer the questions. Uh, it's self-paced. So yes, it's available. Incredible. I also have courses on the Gita for studying the Gita, Gita key verses, and an introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. So they are on my Gita Daily website. Those courses. So you go to the Gita, the www.gitadaily.com. Yes. And people could take these courses. Yes. How many, I think there are several of him. Like they all look the same, but he's doing like all these different things, right? Yeah. How's he doing all that? How's he doing all that? <laughs> he doesn't waste time. That's what it is. I wish I could learn. Doesn't waste it. any time. We're quite. We're always impressed, Prabhu. We've got lots of questions for you, because there's certain things I just can't figure out about oh. my life and about <laughs> metaphysical questions, and I'm ready to like put them all on you, sir. Matter of fact, when people write us, sometimes it goes, "I need a teacher. I need a direction. I need some help." I go, "Yep, Chaitanya Charan. Here's this. <laughs> I, I just push them over to you. You are our go-to for transcendental information." So maybe I could start off with a question. Yes, and, and it has to do with, um, you know, it, it's just on my mind, as we are reading Srimad Bhagavatam daily, as part of Wisdom of the Sages. And for instance, this past week, we were in a chapter, in the previous week, we were in a, the previous week, we were in a chapter where we read that uh, the creator of the universe, four-headed Lord Brahma, sitting on a lotus, that grew out of the navel of Vishnu. Mm. Uh, from his nostril came Lord Vishnu in another form, in the form of a wild boar who subsequently picked the earth up out of the water <laughs> and then fought a huge demon <laughs> and defeated him. <laughs> and then the next chapter described the birth of that demon. And um, it described that uh, the, the parents of the demon uh, were, um, it, 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 you know, it described um, Diti, who's the, the mother of the demons, of, a, of a, like I say, of a dynasty of demons. And mm -hmm. she's uh, sexually agitated. She's uh, pulling her husband out of his brahminical meditation and demanding to be satisfied. He's warning her, uh, now's not the right time. Why isn't it the right time? Well, because Lord Shiva is traveling around with all the ghosts and uh, it will be somehow offensive to him and it will bring inauspicious thing. You know, the, the results of it will be very inauspicious, but she's can't be, um, she, you know, she can't be dissuaded. He gives in. After they do the act, he takes a shower, does a little meditation, comes back and reports to her his realizations. Um, this is what will be born, you know, as a result of this. And he says, you'll have two sons that'll be like these universal tyrants. Uh, and then, but you'll have a grandson that'll be a great devotee. And, you know, the reason why you're, the tyrants are going to be born is because your mind is so polluted and because you're not following this, this um, sacred tradition properly. And uh, the reason why you'll, you'll have a birth of a, uh, of a great devotee is because you're actually... Um, have some devotion to Lord Shiva and you also have some devotion to me and so on. So why I bring this all up is I say hearing all this, like I think all of us here, we feel like we're getting something out of the Bhagavatam. We're getting something that's valuable, um, even potentially life-changing. But at the same time, I think some of these narrations, they can challenge us. And they can challenge us on two levels. They can challenge us like on just the rational level. Like, come on. You know, he's born from a lotus, he's got four heads, you know, Lord Vishnu just comes out of his nose, 
you know, I'm, I'm supposed to accept that. Is it just a story? Am I meant to get a lesson from it, but I can set the story aside? Or are you tell me that it's actually possible that this could happen in other worlds? So on a rational level, it's challenging, and also on an ethical level. Um, I just think, you know, in one sense, when you hear that story, it's kind of like, okay, the husband is like the smart and deeply spiritual, self-controlled guy, and the wife is less intelligent and less yogic and less controlled and out of control, and he's got to come in and lecture her about what's going to happen, mansplain everything to her, and, you know. He mansplained so, E.T. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> oh, God. so, so you know, it's, it is challenging on many levels, and I was just, you know, I, we always appreciate your insights, and we know you think deeply about these things, so I was just wondering, you know, can you shed some light on this, or just share your thoughts on it? Yes, there's a lot, lot you got in over yeah. here. I threw a lot on so, the table there for you. <laughs> so let me start with the point that you know, these are questions that any thoughtful person will have. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur is a prominent Acharya in our tradition. He's the spiritual master of the spiritual master of Srila Prabhupada. So he wrote an essay on the Bhagavat. And uh, he. An essay fact, on the Srimad Bhagavatam. In the Srimad Bhagavatam. And there, in fact, he is addressing the intellectual elite of Bengal. He was in the uh, second half of the 19th century, he lived. And mm -hmm. he anticipates three problems in understanding the Bhagavatam. Okay. And those problems are, he says, problems from a rational perspective, problems from an ethical perspective, and problems from a metaphysical perspective. Okay. And he gives a framework for how to address them. So let's look at, I'll briefly explain the framework. So he says that depending on individual consciousness, a person may be at three levels. He'll, he says, he uses Sanskrit words, Kanishta, Madhyama, Uttama. Okay. So we could say that the first, we could say the preliminary level, intermediate level, and the ultimate level, you can say. And he. That's in terms of one spiritual development? Yeah, I'll caliber. explain what he means by that. What he explains, what, how he explains those words. Okay. So he says that the first level or the preliminary level is where a person focuses on the ritual, the literal, the external. Hmm. So, and most people throughout human history, even those who have turned toward any kind of path, they are external. It's not just in religion. Whenever mm -hmm. there are two groups of people. You know, if say two groups of people are fighting with each other, then if somebody is seen as say carrying the flag of a particular country, that means you must be my enemy. That person may actually love the other country. That person may be empathic. So most people look at externals. So this is That's just superficial. Human most people are going to be relatively superficial. Yeah. So this is just human tendency, and this applies in the religious domain also. And so those people they consider the essence of uh, of when they study scripture, when they practice, they consider rituals to be the essence. When they study scripture, they consider the literal meaning to be the essential meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> he calls such people as uh, Bharavahi. Bharavahi means burden carrying. I'm sorry, they're carrying? Burden, okay. burden. They're, they're carrying, carrying a burden. A burden. Burden carrier. Okay. So burden carrier. So that they somehow or the other ha have to justify that this is exactly what it is and this is what it means. They so become in apologists our, in a sense? Is well, that... I mean, even the next level also can be apologists. Okay. But here it is like more like they are certain that this is the truth and they don't care for any objections or opposition to the truth. Their version of the truth. You know, we have literalists in every tradition. I mm -hmm. think I was in Texas and I saw one person on their car they had written hmm, that God, uh, <laughs> God said it, I accept it, the, the Bible says it, I accept it, that settles it. <laughs> well, that's Texas for you. Hey, welcome to Texas. <laughs> I, why can't I imagine you in Texas? I just can't imagine you in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so now... So this is literalist. Now we have to consider. Now I'm not. Uh, bl I mean, not blaming Bible or Christianity over here. There are also sophisticated theologians in Christianity, but this is the attitude that many people have. And he doesn't. Bhaktivinoda Thakur doesn't criticize or demean such people. He says they are at a particular level, and that is the way 
they can understand and approach mm-hmm. but then he says that is not the only way to approach the second level he says is the madhyam or the intermediate level so you could put it uh, the first is the ritual level second mm-hmm. is the more rational or intellectual level mm. and such people he encourages them to be not burden carriers but essence seekers mm-hmm. paragrahi paragrahi, paragrahi. Essence seekers. That's a great hashtag, Mara. Essence seeker. That's a great T-shirt. Essence seeker. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, okay. as an essence seeker, so their focus is on. So, so he encourages that. What is the purpose of these books that have been written? So, for example, if you consider the Shrimad Bhagavatam, the broad context is uh, there is a king who has been cursed to die. Parikshit is. Rishi is about to die, Maharaj. Mm-hmm. And he is sitting and hearing these stories. Now, what is the purpose for hearing these stories? His purpose is to spiritualize his consciousness. He is not there for amusement. He is not there for just killing time till death comes upon him. So he is seeking spiritual meaning through these stories. Mm. So he is seeking to elevate his consciousness, and that is the purpose. which unifies which has unified seekers throughout history in approaching the bhagavatam that so when we study the bhagavatam we have to see how can this story uh, help me to raise my consciousness so that approach that spiritualizing the consciousness now that now does that mean that we reject everything that doesn't conform to our conceptions no that's not the point and i'll ad- address specific con- objections rational ethical soon based on what bhagwan thakur says but he says the purpose has to be clear and then the third i'll come back to the second level later this okay. is called solid intellectual or the rational level and then the third level is the transcendental or he says the rasic level transcendental level are those who are relishing rasa rasa is the taste of love for krishna so they are absorbed in love for krishna they are experiencing an ocean of divine emotions and in one sense they have attained the highest fulfillment that the soul is capable of experiencing mm-hmm. and so, so he doesn't say that that those who either literally accept everything that the bhagavatam says or they reject anything that doesn't conform to what the their conceptions are that they are the best he says those who are experiencing love for krishna they are the highest so the purpose in this the i mean say the way to progress in this trajectory in this three level uh, progression is to get to learn to love krishna and to become absorbed in love for krishna so now while we are progressing towards that so at the intermediate level when we are we may find certain things which may not make uh, make as i said logical sense so there's two issues logical and ethical so mm-hmm. let's uh, uh, talk about the logical perspective logical point now sure so sure. now what bhaktivinoda thakur states and i will paraphrase and elaborate on it he says that that material information in scripture there is there is some material information and there is some spiritual information so the point is that material information is relative it keeps changing so if we consider even from the perspective of science scientific knowledge is progressing at the same time it is evolving what was considered a fact today what was considered a fact a few hundred years ago or even 50 years ago that may be rejected now mm-hmm. so um, there's a famous scientist i think he said that now as a philosopher of science he says that the the fact the theories we like we call them facts the facts we don't like we call them theories <laughs> <laughs> the, now again this is not a criticism of science science we it is because of science we are able to have this communication the point is that even science acknowledges that we can never have conclusive knowledge mm. because at the material level the things are changing our capacity to observe the things are changing our own intellectual conceptions of how to analyze what we have observed that's changing so three things the things themselves are changing the instruments the external instruments the tools we use for observing them are changing and our own intellectual conceptions 
of how to process those things they are changing <laughs> so because of that material knowledge keeps changing mm. and uh, that's why uh, they say that when we talk about facts this is this factual so he says we don't see facts independent of the theories it is based on a particular theory that we have that we look at facts so i'll explain what i mean by this that so you talked about say ha uh, vishnu coming out of the nose of uh, brahma or whatever or many unbelievable seeming things like that so what science itself is aware of is that when science observes how does it science learn knowledge it is it is that we observe something maybe once twice three times four times 10 times 100 times and then we arrive at a theory when i was in england i was invited to speak on science and spirituality at cambridge university so while driving we passed by the tree where newton is said to have seen that apple fall some people say it fell on his head some people say it fell in front of him so that tree is preserved it's like a pilgrimage place for scientists <laughs> or, or scientific students now when newton saw that fruit falling what happened was that was a one time incident but then from that he asked what made this fruit fall and then he came up with a theory of gravity which is his brilliance but how was that theory confirmed that by this okay this apple for apple fell there's a stone fall does a iron block fall does it fall here only in england does it fall in france does it fall in america so science basically looks at when a observation is made is it no uh, is it repeated over time and over space and if it is repeated over time and space then we call it a theory and a theory eventually if it is further uh, vindicated by experiments then it becomes it considers a proven theory then it becomes a law okay. so the point is that why am i talking about this is when we talk about something being logical or rational what we essentially mean is that this is logical or rational means this makes sense based on my experience and my extrapolation from that experience so this is what i have experienced this is how things work and this is how things can work but this doesn't seem to make sense this may not work like this this doesn't make sense so what we consider rational what we consider possible is based on two things our experience and what we consider as a acceptable extrapolation from that experience it's like so there's conjecture always involved yeah but so but even now newton's theory which was considered to be a universal truth scientists then found that if we go deep into the atom then objects don't fall objects the fundamental particles don't obey the principle of gravity and that's why we came up with quantum physics so gravity is not exactly a universal law that applies everywhere now it's a more complicated thing but at the fundamental particle level there are there are other forces that there is the strong force and the weak force that applies so then newton's theory was nuanced it is true but it is not universally true <laughs> it is not true at the fundamental particle level so why am i giving this example i don't want to go into science too much but this illustrates the logical error in something called as uniformitarianism mm -hmm. uniformitarianism is the is the thought system which holds that all of reality across space and time behaves uniformly that means the way i have experienced things the way we have experienced things that is how everything happens everywhere so uniformitarianism is sometimes assumed to be true or is assumed to be logical is assumed to be rational but there is there is no guarantee that it is so it is not a it is not a scientifically proven or even a scientifically provable theory possible so it's not that everything everywhere has to work the same way it works in our experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so now what does this mean now does this mean that uh, anything can happen anywhere no that's not the exact point the point is that if something doesn't seem to work so it doesn't seem sensible according to our conceptions that doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible you know even mm -hmm. shakespeare i think in macbeth he says to uh, it's a, and in hamlet he says to horatio there are more things in the universe than what your philosophy can imagine mm -hmm. so so the idea is that the universe is much more complex than our conceptions of the universe 
so mm-hmm. certain things may be possible somewhere now how exactly does it happen how can say somebody be born from the nose of someone now if you want to go into specifics we can look at specific explanations that when if the lord is appearing the lord does not require uh, he comes in a spiritual form so he does not require to get a material body which comes by normal human processes of reproduction so he can come in any way and so he does not necessarily have to obey the normal laws of nature so in fact uh, this raises the response to the question what ragunath pro mentioned that is this a miracle so <laughs> <laughs> this is important. Listen up, Rogan. This is going to be important. I'm, I'm right on now. the edge of my seat, and don't. <laughs> and you know, my my phone's going crazy. Everybody wants the uh, answers about the Naga people. We all want to go there. <laughs> are you yeah. Are you just making that up? No, my phone's buzzing out of control right now. <laughs> okay. Naga people, Naga people. Don't forget that question. <laughs> okay. Um, with respect to miracles, you know, generally there are three questions which uh, we can be asked from a uh, from a, pers- a logical perspective. Say. did the event actually happen if somebody says it was a miracle so did it actually happen hmm? mm-hmm. and the second is can it is it not explainable by natural means mm-hmm. by natural means by our natural factors and forces the two individuals by the same name being there next to each other it's rare so we mm-hmm. could say it improbable but it's not impossible okay that shot that one down rogana yeah <laughs> sherry sorry <laughs> okay. So so then the third is if it can't be explained by natural forces then is that an action of action of a deity or a divinity mm-hmm. so then what what we call as a miracle so einstein has famously said that there are two ways of living life one is to see everything as a miracle and one other is to see nothing as a miracle It so is. so in one sense just because something happens routinely doesn't make it less extraordinary the prabhupad would give the example that mm, that's so interesting just, uh, oh, let's repeat that one let's repeat let's, yeah let's repeat that that's very interesting there's miracles that are happening routinely you're saying yeah so just because something happens ordinarily doesn't make it uh, or routinely they're happening doesn't make it any less extraordinary So Prabhupada says that you know you just feed some grass to a cow and it gives milk. Now how extraordinary is that? <laughs> right. You know, is it that easy to make a machine in which we put in grass and uh, it gives milk? That's a Krishna miracle. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> it's miraculous. You know, one, of, one of my friends is uh, he's done his uh, he's you could say a scientist researcher in the digestive system. and he says now when the body stops working we try to get uh, some artificial parts if my hand gets cut or gets damaged i can get a, a, a limb artificial limb for that purpose if my heart is not working i can get a pacemaker if my kidney is not working i can do dialysis so now when people have digestive problems so they thought that can we create a artificial digestive machine and put it in the belly so that the digestion can happen hmm. now they trying it and make made some advancement but digestion is such a complicated phenomena now i talked with this friend about 3 years ago so he said that you know current according to current science we would require not a machine but a factory a factory <laughs> that would run into several miles several to miles act, several miles to now now of course nanotechnology and things may have changed but mm. the idea is that it's a extremely complicated process so if we consider in terms of science you know that we say is required a lot of work so the, in science they say work means force and displacement i have to carry a huge bag and i have to carry it for a lot of distance that's a lot of work so if we consider that work so the amount of work required to digest a morsel of food when the food goes inside it goes into an alimentary canal and it gets processed it's pressed again and again and again and again so we consider that work so actually the amount of work required to digest one morsel of food is more than the amount of work that an average human being performs throughout the day wow most of us don't live phys- don't do physical labor much no so so who is performing that work hmm. it's a miracle <laughs> it's almost like you know, the only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so and ball, of course, you know, yeah. Christian is going to say in the 15th chapter, I am the fire of digestion in, in all bodies yeah. of all living beings, right? Yeah. So, so, that's 1514. Yeah. So, he says, I am the digestive fire. So, that means just the act, that activity of digestion, it is so routine. But that doesn't make it any less extraordinary in terms of the complexity. And even you could say from a mathematical perspective, improbability. One of my friends is also a space scientist. So he was researching that how probable is it that we may, that the way the universe has come out according to science from a particular way, the Big Bang and all that thing, how probable is it that we may find another planet with life on it? Mm -hmm. So they say that the probability is impossibly low. Right. Why but would then, it be, why? It's a mathematical calculation that it, this, it takes so much, everything, ha all these mathematically, so many things have to fall right into place for life to arise. Is it like that? What, what are the probabilities of their theories correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. No, but just three, four things we could say is that, you know, if the Earth were a little closer to the sun or a little further from the sun. Right. Life would, it would be too hot or too cold. If the Earth were moving around, rotating on its axis too fast, a little faster, a little slower, a little faster, we would have all kinds of storms and we would have a lot of planetary imbalance. So a lot of things like that. But the point is that when they say that the probability of life evolving on, uh, uh, of conditions suitable for life coming on some other planet and then life coming on those planets, it's impossibly low. But then that applies, that impossibly low probability applies even to Earth. And still we are here. Mm, yeah, right. So, our very existence is also a miracle. So, our very, if you look at the you, cosmology from the perspective of modern science, even right. our very existence is a miracle. So, that's why Einstein says one way to look at it is to see nothing as a miracle, and the other is to see everything as a miracle. So, so, we could say some miracles are familiar to us, and sometimes we lose the sense of the miraculous in them. And some miracles are so unfamiliar that we deem them impossible. So while we're on this planet talk, what there are other planets? We we understand like um, materialists or people who have no faith in Vedic culture. They think well, you know, the probability is very very low. But in the Vedic paradigm, there's planets like Earth out there. Is that true? Is that what the is that what the Vedic paradigm teaches? There's other earthly planets where there's other things going on like it goes on in Earth, where there's good times and bad times, hot and cold, distress and happiness. It, they have the same sort of ups and downs as Earth. Are they actual planets you can go to, you could visit? What's, what's our idea behind that? I always wanted to ask a spiritual scientist these questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So two things, I'll talk from the say, material or scientific perspective and from a spiritual perspective. Okay. See, from the scientific perspective, all that uh, honest scientists can say is that life as we know it has not been found on any other planets. There are two things. We haven't searched the whole universe. We haven't found in whatever we have searched. And what have we not found? Life as we know it. Life as we know it means that generally life as we know it requires a particular temperature range. It requires sure. oxygen. It requires water. So when scientists say we have not found life on other planets, what they, it's not that they scan every centimeter of that planet to check whether there's life on it. They just right. check whether there is moisture, there is water, water is there or not, whether there is oxygen there or not, whether temperature is conducive for life or not. Sure. So that's all. So that's all. So science can only say that life as we know it has not been found on other planets. And there is there is a renegade scientist who is who is proposed. <laughs> who is this renegade? <laughs> who is that renegade scientist? <laughs> it's like the guy from Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I can get that name. But anyway, he has proposed that maybe on the moon, where several expeditions have gone, we have not buried, we have not dug under the crust of the moon. Maybe there is there are microbes and life forms under the crust of the moon. Sure. So the point is that science, scientific knowledge, so science does not say that life doesn't exist on other planets. All that it can say is life as we know it has mm -hmm. not been found on other planets. Yeah, sure. So, but what, who's to say is like, I'm not looking for life as we know it. 
If I'm going to another yeah. planet, I want to see life <laughs> as, as I, I don't can know never it. perceive of it, and I never can guess of it. Hairy, <laughs> massive, hairy beings, you know, long, Snake spindly beings. beings, round beings that roll. I'm not looking for a guy that looks like Italian like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Prabhu, it, it's interesting because um, what you're bringing up is actually something that Raghunath and I just happened to speak about a, a few days ago, is that even as children, like both he and I shared this idea that like, you know, we would hear a teacher say that life cannot exist on these other planets because the conditions for life don't exist. And even as children, we thought, well, what if there's other life that doesn't need the same conditions that we have? And, and almost, like in other words, it almost seems like um, we have the potential to be over intelligent about something, right? Like, in other words, I've got I've gained so much material knowledge, but I've kind of lost a little bit of like broad mindedness that's necessary for rational thinking. And so, how could I say life can't exist on any other planet because the conditions don't exist there? When even a child could understand, well, maybe other life doesn't need those conditions. That's beautifully put in. See, rationality began as a call for open-mindedness. You could say, if you look at the history of in, intellectual history of the West, of course, rationality has been there since Greco-Roman times, uh, Greek, Greek times, but especially in the modern times. So uh, the the religious theocracy or religious rules they had certain close-mindedness, and rationality was let's be open-minded, let's think about it, let's explore, let's explore mm -hmm. the world. The so rationality began as open-mindedness. But unfortunately, in the name of rationality today, people are being encouraged to become close-minded or not just encouraged, mandated. Sure. This is not mm. possible. This right. is not possible. And you'll be so, canceled in a sense. <laughs> you know, they, canceled canceled scientists. But, but scientists will be canceled if they yeah. uh, um, broadcast ideas like this. They won't get funding, yeah. right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is that if we consider from the human per broad perspective of human society, one genre of uh, movies that is immensely popular is sci-fi, mm -hmm. yeah. science fiction. You no, know, the DC universe, the Marvel universe, so many things like that. It's, there's blockbuster movies, so we can say that the. At Oh, oh. <laughs> he breathes. Oh, hold on. Oh, 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 Prabhu, you froze on us for a second. Please uh, start that sentence again. We can Sorry. say. So I was talking about the, the blockbuster movies are blockbuster movies of science fiction. Yeah. So from that, we can infer that attraction to the supernatural hmm. is natural for the human heart or the human mind, whatever, for human beings. Mm -hmm. Hold it. Get that one. There's a hashtag, Mira. Attraction yeah. to the supernatural. Attraction to the supernatural is natural. Is natural. So it's it's everybody wants so in one sense we have said this is how this works this is how this works this is how this works but then we want to know is there something more is something beyond and people are attracted by fascinating powers that certain superheroes have or even some or otherwise ordinary people have so if if the universe were so cut and dry that there is nothing possible within the i won't say within the limits of rationality i'll say it's within the limits of how we have defined rationality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then why would we have attraction for something beyond that so maybe there is something in the universe beyond that now this is not a foolproof argument i'm not making a foolproof argument yes but it's a food for thought for open-minded open-minded exploration yeah that just because we have an attraction so much so why is it that this that we humans whatever we are called are trained to believe as rational we want to suspend our rational faculty and enjoy things which seem irrational. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> so in other words, it's almost like um, one could, one, one possible explanation is that programmed in us somewhere is the desire to seek truth that lies beyond what our senses can perceive. Yes, perfect. That's true. And ultimately, you know, the, the supreme supernatural reality is Krishna. So uh, the soul, the heart, human heart longs for Krishna and longs to celebrate the supernatural activities of Krishna. And not knowing about Krishna, we celebrate and cherish the supernatural activities of other heroes that we have created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To so, fill, a, a fill, fill that God-shaped hole. Fill that hole, God-shaped hole, beautifully put, yeah. <laughs> Once so, you... 
once you break down the so-called rational mind, then it makes you want to answer. Then it makes you want to really ask, well, all right, well, what do you guys believe? What is the what do the Vedic teachings teach? Here's here's a good one. We're talking about Diti and Aditi. One gives birth to the demons. One gives birth to the demigods. Here's a question for you. Who gives birth to all the humans? Like, who's my ancestor? Is it from a demigod or there's progenitors put on Earth birthing out different human races? <laughs> Where are we coming from? Who's the father of mankind? Is it one person? Are we, is, is like me and America and Kastuba all related to one another? We're just distant cousins? What's going on? <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, before I answer this question, uh, let me put a, let, let me draw the importance of how our perception or our, per, the way we pursue things changes what we perceive. So say, consider that, uh, say I have a, say a black coal, charcoal and I have white chalk and I crush both of them into powder okay. and I mix them, mix the tooth thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And then I look at it. I see it is, it is a gray powder. Mm -hmm. Now, if I look at the same thing under a microscope, now I don't see any gray powder at all. Also. I see mm -hmm. black particles and I see white particles. Okay. I like now, this. what is it? What is it really? <laughs> I can work with this. Okay. <laughs> so what is it really? Now, is it gray powder? Black, black particles and white particles. So that now what we call as reality depends on our scale of perception. Oh man, I like so, hold it. I got to note that down. What we call reality depends on our scale of perception. So what this means is that from our scale of so the two things can seem completely different from different scales of perception, the black and white particles or a gray powder. So similarly, many of the incidents that are described in the Bhagavatam, they are described from the perspective of the Devas. They are described from a, you could say, a, not exactly a spiritual, but a celestial perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, from the perspective of the Devas. So, in the whereas we humans pursue things from our human perspective. Mm. So, now it is not, if, if two people start arguing, is this black, is this brown powder, is this brown powder or is this uh, white and black particles? Well, it's both. It's just a different perception, mm -hmm. different scale, of, different scale, of, scale of observation. You could say. So, so many of the things that seem irrational for us when we study the Bhagavatam, they are just things which have been described from a different scale of observation. Huh. So, within uh. that scale of observation, yes, it is. To answer your specific question, that yes, Diti and Aditi they give birth to. Uh, the devtas and the demons and the, dev the god demigods and the demons. Now, human beings come from a being called Manu. Manu Swayambhu Manu is the progenitor of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so, there is a certain level of uh, generation of life forms that happens at the higher planets, in the higher levels of reality. And from there, a human being comes to the earth and then human population grows over here. So now, now, if you look at our modern scientific way of looking at things, we may ha we have a particular version of history that particular vision of history that, you know, there was a Stone Age man and then there was this and there was this and there was this. And that's how living beings have come about. Now, these two don't have to necessarily be contradictory. Mm -hmm. That what the Bhagavatam is describing is how life came in the universe at different levels. Now, after human beings came on the earth, there could have been many ups and downs. We don't have a complete record of human history. At everything that has happened everywhere. Now, if you consider uh, evolution, it's based on fossils. And scientists yeah. themselves say that you know, almost uh, foss when fossils are preserved under the earth, that uh, they, what happens is most of the earth, uh, if there are rains and the topsoil gets slipped, topsoil gets washed away, denuded, eroded, and so he says the most of the fossils in the earth are at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. And we don't have access to them. So I'm not saying that archaeology is wrong. I'm just saying that within the methodology of archaeology itself, there are limitations. 
तो वी हैव वन विजन ऑफ हिस्ट्री दैट साइंस हैज गिवन अस एंड अनदर विजन ऑफ हिस्ट्री दैट भागवतम हैज गिवन अस एंड द टू डोंट हैव टू बी सीन एज कॉन्ट्रडिक्टरी they are just two different ways of looking at reality from two different scales of observation okay now what you're telling me sounds very rational like i can appreciate what you're saying if you don't if you don't mind just let me complete this Yo, point i'm sorry okay so, <laughs> as i said that you know by placing science and scripture in competition we devalue scripture and we devalue science they are two different branches of knowledge they are two different ways of looking at the world see when why why do we de- alex why we devalue scripture and why we devalue science we devalue scripture because scripture is giving us another body of knowledge it is when parikshit maharaj is hearing the bhagavatam he is not hearing bhagavatam primarily for precise history of the universe he is hearing the bhagavatam to hear how throughout the history of the universe there are people who have sought higher consciousness there are people who have sought to know the meaning of life there are and there are people who have achieved that hmm. so he is studying history for talking for to know about those who have transcended in a sense transcended history okay who have attained eternal life so history is within the time domain so his knowledge is not primarily his interest is not primarily in history mm-hmm. it is in those who have in throughout history transcended the world similarly when the bhagavatam is describing uh, cosmology its purpose is not to describe cosmology its purpose is to describe how throughout the cosmos there are there are living beings who are who are trying to know who are worshiping god who are following karma who are seeking spiritual consciousness mm-hmm. probably you'll come to the fifth canto later and there are five nine chapter the 10 chapters 16 to 25 which describe the cosmology but the actual verses about cosmology are barely about 20% and 80% verses there are that in this planet these beings are offering these prayers to god mm-hmm. and this planet these beings are offering these prayers to god the bhagavatam's focus is clear so when we place science and scripture science and bhagavatam in competition we are devaluing scripture because scripture is giving us knowledge of how to raise our consciousness how to attain krishna mm mm-hmm. and science gives us knowledge we could say of how to function in the world how to function in the world so there are two different branches of knowledge and the two two don't have to be in they don't have to be competitive they can be complementary they don't mm-hmm. have to be contradictory they can be complementary okay if i'm understanding correctly it's almost something like this like say um i bring a friend to a restaurant to eat and they have their own conception of like what the proper dining experience is or what like an excellent dining experience is and it has to do with the atmosphere in the restaurant and as well as the quality of the food and they have a particular taste of what like you know they they like some fancy place let's say and then i bring them to like a place that's like not fancy at all it's like the externally it's like it's very different it's like it almost to them when they walk in there they're looking and they're saying this is not a good restaurant you know there's this it's like picnic tables here and you know the, the, they serve you on paper plates and some but then the person says hold it you're you're looking at this the wrong way we're not here for the externals and some people might even consider these externals charming in a way that's you know that's another question but let's focus on the important thing here and that's the quality of the food and what you're going to get here is like super excellent food and so someone might approach the bhagavatam and start getting caught up in all these details that are less essential yes and when and whether those details are right or wrong whether they're true or false isn't the question right now mm. yes exactly but, yeah but the question getting is obsessed, getting yeah. obsessed over the question whether this is right or wrong is what bhakti vinod thakur considers to be a burden carrier a gotcha mm. oh, okay. okay yeah So now of course we all can analyze and say if somebody find I just can't accept this there are ways in which it can be explained so which which is which makes it intelligible mm-hmm. so we, that's why we discuss some explanations they can make it intelligible but the point is that whether this is right or wrong f- from our scale of perception it's very difficult to ascertain that sure and that's not the point right so i'll just give another example to illustrate this i like the example of dining say 
uh, in India, cricket is very common. But let's take billiards. Okay, okay. billiards. Billiards. Okay. Billiards is reasonably <laughs> common. Say now, if somebody is playing billiards and there's an expert <laughs> player, the player plays hits with a stick. His ball hits that ball. That ball hits that ball. That ball hits that ball. And then that ball goes into the hole, and he wins the match. He becomes a champion. Okay. Now, if we had a camera. Which was observing that billiards board from above, only the only the billiards table, nothing more. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the ball, saw the balls moving. This stick hit over here, and this ball moved. And then that ball went into the hole. The entire motion of all the balls could be explained in terms of the laws of physics. Sure. Because this stick hit this ball with this force at this angle. And that's why it hit this, 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 and that's how the ball went in the hole. Now that's a correct explanation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if we expand the focus of the camera, and then we see there's a champion billiards player over there, mm. and why did the ball go into the hole? Because this this player is a, such a champion. He's practiced so much. He has so much talent, and he hit the ball. It went into the hole. So. the the we could say the physical or the mechanical explanation and the personal explanation they are not contradictory they are complementary mm -hmm. so with the, within the frame if i am only looking at the table then i have to explain the motion of the balls in terms of the laws of physics and i get a correct explanation now is that correct explanation the only correct explanation is that the complete explanation mm -hmm. no does that explanation if i say the ball went into the hole because of the laws of physics does that mean if i say the ball went into the hole because this player is so expert does that make that explanation wrong no that's why i said that you know so there's a personal explanation and there's a mechanical explanation right and both of them are right depending on the here also the scale of perception right because the scope of perception so we don't have to put these two explanations in opposition to each other so that's why i said we if we if we put science and scripture in competition we devalue scripture but we also devalue science mm. because Very science does gives us give us a valid knowledge it's useful knowledge valuable knowledge but science doesn't bring in the personal element okay the mechanical laws of physics are important So it's so what you're it, it's interesting because if I'm understanding you correctly you're saying that um you mentioned you began with saying that there's these three different levels of of understanding and and one is the literalist yeah uh and then there's a higher level of understanding um which is still more rational actually um but but on that level they're they're questioning and they're trying to broaden perspective whereas like the person on the first level actually um and and you mentioned this to me the other day the person on the first is that they're on the lower level but they actually think they're on a higher level because they don't have doubts because yeah. they right they're like those people know less cuz they 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 have doubts i know it it says it right here and and it seems to me like what you're saying is even the even these super intelligent people that are very advanced in science they may sometimes they're operating on that lower level. They're high on a low level. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> They're high on a low level. <laughs> well, that, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that 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 although they have like a a brain that operates very efficiently and 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 is full of information that others may be you know have no access to. Their their actually their level of rational thought is somewhat stunted or or, or undeveloped that they can't even conceive that Oh, maybe there is a broader perspective. And and that although I I have a lot of incredible insight on my perspective, it's just one small part of a larger picture. Yes, true. See, uh there are two words, there is science and there is scientism. Okay. Scientism is the imperialism of science or imperialism in the name of science. Science okay. plus is imperialism. So, uh, what I mean by that is that science is a tool for acquiring knowledge and it can give a lot of valid knowledge but there are some people who who put a halo of omniscience around science mm -hmm. 
and they say the only valid knowledge is what has come from science so if anything cannot be understood through science that is not worth knowing that doesn't exist that is wrong so now scienti- it's it's ironic that scientism is a it, it claims to be based on science but right. there is no scientific proof for scientism right <laughs> there is no scientific way to prove that science is the only source of all knowledge so it's like a fallacy the whole thing yeah it's was. a logical fallacy it's a logical fallacy so yeah. yes so i would say there are many scientists who are very broad minded einstein himself you know he said that the the, the sense of mystery that is the womb of all inquiry and in fact he very said that the that the sciences the, art, the in his time he didn't use the word spirituality he used the word religion it says religion science and art are all fruits of the same tree of human knowledge mm-hmm. so there are just different ways in which we look at the universe and we come up with different 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 understandings mm-hmm. so that's why there is no need for uh these to be seen as contradictory they can be complementary and uh would you say that the need to see them contradictory is symptomatic of the kanishta um mentality yes yes definitely that see there is that this brings again the point of humility that faith some people think faith means certainty that this is how it is and everything else is wrong but if have faith in god uh, then what it would also mean is that i understand that god is far bigger than me and god's creation is far bigger than me mm-hmm. the way god works is maybe far bigger than how i can understand it so faith we can have certainty in the existence of god certainty in the benevolence of god but there may be uncertainty in exactly how god is working do i do i really understand how? so that is humility mm-hmm. and uh, so i would say that that's what creates openness in fact if you want to learn from life what how do we learn from life we approach every moment we approach every event we approach every person with a sense of vulnerability with a sense of openness now what can i learn from this what can i learn fear even when we are going to teach someone i may say i know the truth and i am going to teach it but if i hear from those who i am going to te- going to teach i learn a lot so i would say that answer the willingness to be open to learn to reexamine one's own understanding that is a sign of spiritual advancement so uncertainty or doubts they don't necessarily mean a lack of faith so i say that doubts may be because of absence of faith but doubts may also be because of presence of introspection mm-hmm. presence of intelligent contemplation is that person that's pushing the borders of the limits of their perception or the limits of their understanding yeah. yes true perfect oh. so yeah. prabhu you have um blown everyone's mind here yeah um but one question is left unanswered and people are demanding an answer to this question. Mara, I can look at it on her face right now. Mara's like, "What about the snake people? What about <laughs> is there a planet of snakes? Let's just let's just go. We're we're not even questioning anymore. Tell us <laughs> about we're, the we're just tell of, us. We'll accept just it. Just tell us. We'll accept. We'll believe. <laughs> we understand that there's rational mind and there's a bigger mind. Tell us the Vedic perception, the Vedic conception of the planet of snakes, subterranean heavens. Can you talk about the universe according to the Vedic version? Yeah. So basically that what is what is the purpose of the universe? It is to facilitate the souls to fulfill their desires for pleasure according to their own conceptions. And different bodies offer different kinds of pleasure. So the snake body offers a particular kind of pleasure, but the snake body cannot offer much pleasure on a planet where there are many other living beings and they are fighting and they are dominating <laughs> okay Good so point. a full potential for pleasure in a snake body can come on a planet where the snakes are ruling <laughs> there you go there you go let's make let's come mara it's answered now 
<laughs> you need a you need a master snake if you want to enjoy in a snake body. You need snake activities. Yeah, snake, snake. government to snake snake yeah, sports, the, sporting yeah. events. <laughs> <laughs> What's a subterranean heaven? Yeah, so the idea is that when we are on Earth, this is in be between the two levels. There is the higher planets, which are the heavens, and there are lower planets. But what happens is, karma is never black and white. Mm. It's not that everyone who is bad has always done all bad things throughout their life. Sure. And everyone is good has always done good things in their life. So sometimes, some people may have done some bad things because of which they go to the lower planets. But they have also done some good things. Sure. That's why they're in a lower planet, but they are relatively in prosperity. So that subterranean planet, they are like, uh, you could say, a five-star jail. You have to... <laughs> five-star jail. <laughs> five-star jail. They have them in America. <laughs> so it's subterranean, somebody... heavenly planet. Okay. Yeah. They're high on a low level. It's yeah. High, yeah. I, I like that. That's beautiful. <laughs> I, can you just come over and hang out with us and be our friend <laughs> and spend weeks or months with us? Yeah, everybody, you know, uh, I can see on our chat board, uh, people are uh, really, really appreciating all that you've shared with us. We, we, you dealt with our rational question. We didn't, we didn't have time to get to our ethical question. I think we've got to bring you back for that. Maybe we can bring you back soon. Would that be yes, all right? Yes, well, honored to be here. And yes, it was okay, a very boo -boo. stimulating discussion. We're happy to be of service. And whenever you want, I... I'm happy to come. Thank you okay, very much. So, thank you so much. And everyone, please, uh, for more from, from Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, you can go to the website, Spiritual Scientist, thespiritualscientist.com. The Spiritual Scientist. The Spiritual Scientist.com. And, and especially uh, daily, for a day, you know, one of the, the important things about Wisdom of the Sages is that it's a daily thing. That's why it's life changing. That's why it, it takes root, it gets traction, it begins to change your perception and your, your mm -hmm. way of life, your very life. Uh, his Gita Daily is coming out daily. He's got a 300-word, you know, meditation on a different verse from the Bhagavad Gita every day. And, you know, from this conversation, you can understand that he's always got deeper insights and, you know, interesting ways to apply uh, th these teachings from the Bhagavad Gita. So please check out uh, GitaDaily.com. All right? That's right, right? GitaDaily.com? Yes. Okay. Are you coming to America anytime soon? I would love to. I think we just have to wait for the pandemic to get under control. How's bit. India right now? I'm in uh, near Mumbai in Govardhan Eco Village. And, uh, and how are things? Things are your... okay over here. Yeah, it's relatively it's protected. Mumbai still, things are a little bad, but they're better than a month or two ago. Sure. Okay, so okay. it's 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 coming down, and hopefully not more. Yes, now. Definitely. We're hoping to see you in India. We're hoping to have you here. You can come to our wisdom of the sages picnic that would be great <laughs> oh that'd that be really would be great great wouldn't it like all the all the the tug of wars and the the um wrestling would end and everyone would just be sitting around sitting under a tree listening, listening. Yeah. <laughs> well also you know we were doing our uh our um, 300 hour and our wisdom training in india we can have chaitani charan perhaps come and give a class that would be incredible or many classes yeah. Okay, he lives at the Govardhan Eco Village. He lives at the Govardhan Eco Village. Incredible. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for this incredible Sunday morning with the spiritual scientist. Super impressed and super um, uh, just honor honored to have these like uh, great souls in my life that are just like they come to us on a regular basis. I feel so fortunate. Um, thanks for everybody for joining us. I I'm always amazed at people joining every day like this. It's impressive. It changes us. And if you're an old Zoomer out there and now you're an other, we worry about you. Right? Me and Kostuba were saying, whatever happened to the Wilderness family? Right? Uh, the, not the, the Golden Brown family. The Golden Brown family. Where is the Golden, Golden Brown Brown's. family? Where is uh, onion, garlic, ginger? <laughs> where's yeah, where's, onion, the, where's right. onion, garlic, ginger? There's somebody. <laughs> if you're still out there, let us know. Send us an email. If you Just wanna, let us know you're okay. Yes. Make sure you're okay. <laughs> Also, if you like what we're doing, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. Keep this boat floating. Um, I'm back with sweet baby Krishna tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. And uh, we're going to we're diving into these beautiful stories from the 10th canto as well as chanting 
um, Ashtakams, Stutis, Stotrams. Thanks, Verdi, for joining us. And now we do what we do best. We sing, we dance, we leave our body right here. 